Hello. Thank, thank you for coming. Once again, we have another series, Arthur Bergeron, called Making the Best of a Bad Situation. And, be, and before we start, I just want to thank Joyce. This is the last show of 2015, and I really wanted to thank Joyce and the folks who extend their hospitality for me to come here to Tisbury to the Council on Aging. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Arthur. Thank, thank you. you much. Thank you, Joyce. Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, as I had mentioned, this is the last of the presentations of the ser my series this year in wonderful 2015. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. For those of you who haven't been here before, um, Myrick O'Connell is a large 60-person law firm. Uh, this is all that I do. Um, uh, and which I just like doing. If you've got another kind of problem, I'm sure we can figure it out, but I'm not going to figure it out. Um, so, let me, so, as you know, or for folks who have been here before, one of the goals of these presentations is to really give you a sense. I try to introduce you to a lot of the players that you kind of need to know as a senior and stuff, and try to do some more broad issues around what do you need for documents and wills. And then, every once in a while, uh, or actually a couple times a year, I try to do something more specific. This is a very specific topic. This is actually my favorite seminar because it's the one that tends to surprise people the most. Um, but this one's complicated. There's math, there's math on this one. And I just want to kind of caution you before we start. Don't get bothered if you kind of lose track on the math. The goal of the exercise is to understand that if you do this math, you will find that you can always qualify for math health and that the only question then is, based on the math and based on the dollar cents, do you want to qualify for mass health? And I'm talking about specifically qualifying for mass health if you're in a nursing home, which is the place where, of course, nobody ever wants to be. But one of the reasons why you don't want to be there is because you can't afford it, because it costs twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a month to be there. And so it's important to know that in those situations that you can qualify for mass health. So you know my many of you, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and you know, their goal is very simple. They, want, they don't ever want to go to a nursing home. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Uh, when one of them dies, ideally, they'd like to leave everything to the other one, and when the two of them have died, they'd like things to go to the kids. And normally, that would mean selling the house and dividing up all the money, but if they live here on Martha's Vineyard, no one ever wants to sell the house, so it really means trying to figure out how to save the house for the kids. Um, and here are their assets. Have a very small house on Martha's Vineyard, so it's only worth three hundred thousand uh, dollars. He has an IRA of one hundred fifty. They have annuity of one hundred and cash of seventy five. So, for purposes of where we're going to go, just remember that the house is worth three hundred thousand dollars, and all the other stuff that can turn into cash is worth about three twenty five. Frank's income is two thousand dollars a month, all from Social Security. Mary's income is half of his, thousand dollars a month, and they're okay. They've been okay. Um, they, because they don't have a mortgage, so they can kind of survive on all of this and still have a good time, and, and the kids come and visit and stuff. And as long as nobody uh, gets dementia or needs nursing home care or needs a lot of home care, because those are the things, of course, that Medicare does not cover. That's the one of the, I always tell people, most of my clients either are my clients because they worry about getting Alzheimer's or they have Alzheimer's or somebody they know has Alzheimer's or some other disease that causes dementia because the problem with dementia is Medicare doesn't pay for it, right? You can have, you can get cancer and get chemo and you can get amputation. You can do all this stuff as long as it requires skilled care, brain surgery, everything, Medicare pays for it. You need someone though to help you put on your clothes or help you dress in the morning because you have dementia. Well, that's not skilled care, and so Medicare doesn't pay for it. And so people's great fear is to be stuck in a position where they need care which isn't called skilled care and therefore they've got to be paying out of pocket unless they qualify for mass health. So let's take the let's start off with the basic example and you've heard some of this some of these parts before. If if Frank and Mary are both alive and Mary needs nursing home care, of course she's not happy about this and neither is Frank, but they know that even though they've done no advanced planning at all, she can immediately almost qualify for mass health because for her to qualify, she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets, but he can own the home as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. He can have cash or cash equivalent assets, 
of up to $119,220, and he can have unlimited income, unlimited income. So in this situation, if Mary were in the nursing home, we would simply shift everything to Frank, which means the house is now safe because it has an equity of less than $828,000. Frank would have too much in cash or cash equivalents, and so he'd go buy himself an annuity. An annuity, as far as Mass Health is concerned, is not an asset, it's an income stream, as long as it calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. As long as he buys that annuity in any amount, the purchase of that annuity converts his asset to an income stream. He's allowed to have infinite income because he's the spouse at home. And so Mary, the day after Frank buys the annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. We've kind of talked about that part before, so that no planning was needed there. Whenever couples come in and, and say, and I explain that to them, and they say, well, you know, so why should I do anything? I said, well, you really don't have to do anything as long as you both stay alive. Just don't die. The main thing is just don't die. Uh, now, what Frank should do, though, in order to protect Mary in that case, either before she needs it or, or, either, or at the time, is change his will so that if he does die, the assets that are now all in his name will not go to Mary. Because remember, in his existing plan, in their existing plan, when one dies, the other one gets everything. They probably own everything jointly just to take care of that, except the IRA. And she, he's probably named her as his death beneficiary. Well, he doesn't want that to happen. Because then if he dies and she gets everything, whatever she gets is going to have to get spent down, at least all the money, until she has less than $2,000, at which point she'd qualify for MassHealth because the home is not a countable asset. But MassHealth will put a lien on that home to make sure that MassHealth gets repaid. So the main thing that Frank would want to do is make sure he changed his will. And hopefully ahead of time, ahead of time, Mary and Frank would have done powers of attorney, naming each other to act on their behalf. Half, because otherwise, if things were in anything was in Mary's name and Frank needed to shift it out of Mary's name and no one had a power of attorney, he would be up the creek because the money would have to stay in Mary's name until it gets spent down in, on uh, on nursing home care. So the power of attorney is a really, really, really important document. So uh, we just discussed the fact that in this case, if Frank dies, all of Mary's assets are still safe. But what if Frank has died and they haven't done any of those things? Well, in that case, now Mary's still got these assets, because, right, she inherited everything from Frank. She's got the 625. Her uh, income has gone from $1,000 to $2,000 a month, because she's now getting his Social Security check. So now if she needs a nursing home, well, now what? Now what? Um, and the answer that most people will assume is that, well, Mary needs to spend down all of her money. She needs to get that money down below the $2,000, and, and she's going to spend it on the nursing home, and then she'll and then Mary will qualify for MassHealth, but then MassHealth will have a lien on the house. Now, she actually doesn't have to spend all of her money on the nursing home to do that. There are some other things that she can do with her money to qualify for MassHealth immediately. Um, but why would she want to do that? Well, to understand that, you have to understand um, this notion of the burn rate and of the difference between the mass health rate at the nursing home and the private pay rate. So, if Mary were going to a, a I want to say a typical nursing home, but this is not an unusual nursing home, she'd be paying about $12,000 per month on private pay. It is my understanding uh, that Windermere here is now higher than that. Windermere was $12,000 a month not too long ago, so, so, but I'm going to use these numbers. Um, the very same bed in the very same nursing home, if Mary has qualified for Mass MassHealth, um, Mass Health, the, ma the Mass Health rate for that bed and the rate at which Mass Health will pay is about $7,000 a month. Now, I use those figures um, in, in, kind of in general because the, because the, the rate that Mass Health pays just like the rate that you pay is, is actually kind of a negotiated rate. Well, it isn't like negotiated in that there's one private pay rate, although all nursing homes have different private pay rates. But MassHealth has negotiated a rate or a set of rates with every single nursing home in the Commonwealth. I know of no nursing homes that don't take MassHealth. And those rates are based on uh, a table of 1 to 10, uh, categories 1 to 10, depending on the estimated 
the number of nurse minutes per day that the person in the nursing home needs. And the more nurse minutes per day you need, it is assumed, therefore, the more care you need, and therefore, the more that MassHealth will pay. Having said that, MassHealth typically, they're, they're, the amount they'll pay a nursing home is about 7000 and it typically will not range beyond more than like 6500 to 7500 They'll stay in a fairly tight range. And interestingly, the amount that MassHealth pays to a nursing home is totally unrelated to the private pay rate. I found nursing homes that are charging 13000 a month on, on uh, um, private pay, and their mass health rate averages about $7,000. I've seen nursing homes that are charging $9,000 a month on private pay, and their mass health rate averages about $7,000. So they're, all, they're all about the same at, at mass health. So what is important to know, as far as Mary is concerned, is that if she is on mass health, then the, then, then the cost of her bed is $7,000 per month. If she's on private pay, the cost of her bed is $12,000 per month. The difference is $5,000 per month. And the reason why that's so important is because she can't afford to pay either one of those, of course, right? Because her income is only $2,000 per month. Once she gets on Mass Health, by the way, once she's on Mass Health, she will continue to pay her income to the nursing home, right? And then Mass Health will pay the rest. When she's on private pay, of course, she pays her $2,000 to the nursing home, and then she pays the rest. And if she pays on private pay um, at $12,000 minus her income of $2,000 a month, uh, the rate at which her savings will evaporate is about $10,000 per month. That's the burn rate, right? So if Mary is on private pay in that nursing home, and she has $325,000 in assets, remember that was her amount, she owns the house worth three hundred, dollars and then the rest is $325,000. $10,000 a month, all of her money will evaporate in 32.5 months, right? And then MassHealth will put a lien on her house. Or if she has sold her house, because she did, and she moved into assisted living or whatever, she sold her house, and so she has a big pile of cash with $625,000, then all of that money will evaporate at the nursing home on private pay in 62.5 months. $625,000 divided by $10,000, right? So, Compare that to, and we're going to compare that to, how fast that money would evaporate if she were on mass health. Because she, remember, if she's on mass health, that bed is only costing $7,000 a month. So even if her income is going to the nursing home at $2,000 a month, and mass health is paying the rest, the other $5,000, right? And even if Mary has to pay all of that back, eventually, because mass health has a lien on all of the assets. She's only paying it back at the rate of $5,000 a month. Whereas if she stayed on private pay, she was paying $10,000 a month. So she always has a reason to be sitting in that bed on mass health versus sitting in that very same bed in that same nursing home on private pay. Now, the only reason why she might have to be on private pay is, and I think this is a myth, the myth that if you're on private pay in this nursing home, you're getting better care. It has actually been my experience that the opposite is true. That if you're on private pay, unless you're getting a lot of visits, right, on, if you, in, you're married in the nursing home, that, that you kind of start, event, you know, you disappear in the nursing home because no one's coming to see you, and so you're just kind of there. If, on the other hand, you're on Mass Health, well, Mass Health actually sends inspectors into the nursing homes. They send people in undercover. They want to know because they're paying a bundle of money to the nursing home that their people on Mass Health are being well treated. And if you're, they're not being well treated, Mass Health can cut that nursing home off, which means that nursing home goes out of business immediately because they're all living on Mass Health. Most nursing homes, over 70% of all the beds are on Mass Health. So the, it isn't a matter of the quality of care. Okay, so the question is, how can Mary qualify for Mass Health? Assuming that she really wants to, and she should really want to, but can she? Well, let's see. To qualify for Mass Health, the house is, once again, is an accountable asset as long as you say you're going to return home. It makes no difference if you can. As long as on the application you check off the box that says, I intend to return home, the house is not countable, but they'll put a lien on it. She can have up to $2,000 in other assets, cash. And once she's qualified, MassHealth is going to require that she pay all of her $2,000 in income every month, the Social Security check, as opposed to that asset, uh, to the nursing home, all except $72.80.
Once you're on mass health, uh, mass health, the point, point of mass health is it's supposed to be um, um, insurance for the poor. So you're supposed to be poor. So they wanted you to really feel like you're poor. So all they let you keep every month to take care of yourself is $72.80 while you're in the nursing home. They take care of all of the clothes that you lose or maybe getting your hair done, you know, or, well, that's not my problem. If you're, you know, getting your hair done. So, so, so Mass Health will pay the difference then between whatever you're paying, in this case, two thousand a month, and the and the Mass Health rate, which we're assuming is um, seven thousand a month, and then they'll have a lien against assets for the rest. So, there are three ways that Mary can take all of her other assets, the other three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, and restructure them so as to qualify for Mass Health right away. And we're going to talk about all three. She can buy an annuity. She can lend her money to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Jr. and take back a promissory note. Or she can put money in a D4C pooled trust. How many people have ever heard of a D4C pooled trust? Raise your hand. That's two. That's higher than just about any place else where I do this presentation. This, this, is, this is, people are always amazed by the D4C. But we're going to talk about that for a while. So first, the annuity. Mary, if she wants to, can take her $325,000 and buy the very same kind of annuity that Frank bought in the example with Frank. As long as the annuity has e calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than her actuarial life expectancy. Mary, in this example, I should have pointed out on the first slide, is 80 years old. So her actuarial life expectancy is about nine years. As long as the, the, the payments are for a period no longer than her actuarial life expectancy. And as long as they say that MassHealth has a lien, so that if there's any money left when Mary dies and MassHealth has been paying on Mary's behalf, then the, then the payments go to MassHealth until that lien has been paid off. Right? As long as the annuity says that, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to an, to an income stream. Now, once Mary has bought the annuity, the monthly income that's coming from that annuity is now added to her other income, and it goes to the nursing home. So, go back to this example. Mary's got $325,000 in other money, other than the three hundred dollars that's in her house, and she's got income of $2,000. If she takes all $325,000 and buys an annuity for nine years, her life expectancy, then that's 108 payments. If you divide 325,000 by 108, roughly comes out to about $3,000 a month, right? Now, by the way, these annuities pay terrible interest. I mean, you give the money to an insurance company and they give you this back with interest, but it's crummy. So you'd never buy one of these for an investment, right? You only buy one of these to qualify for mass health. They actually call these Medicaid qualifying annuities. If you call the company, that's what they call them, right? So, that she'd be getting a payment now of $3,000 a month, which get, would get added to the other $2,000 in Social Security that she gets every month. So she'd be paying $5,000 a month to the nursing home. Mass Health would pay the difference, the remaining $2,000, and then Mass Health would have a lien for that $2,000, which it would collect after Mary had died, without interest, by the way, without interest. So as a practical matter, Mary is still paying $5,000 a month to that nursing home. But at $5,000 a month, right, if you took um, uh, all her $325,000, that money, instead of lasting, um, or excuse me, if you took her house, if you took all of her money, all $625,000, right, and, and paid at $5,000 a month, if the burn rate were $5,000 a month, then the money suddenly lasts 10 and a half years. Instead of, remember in the other example, if Mary had sold her house and used all the money, the money all ran out after five years? So the money lasts much, much, the, 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 there, there is a much longer period uh, after which, if Mary dies, there's money left over. And during the entire period be between the very first day that this starts and year five, the, the end of the five-year look-back period, she's saving $5,000 a month versus what she would have paid if she had been on private pay. So you see this basic concept? So she, so she has derives a significant financial benefit from being on mass health and therefore reducing her burn rate by $5,000 a month. So that's the first way she could do that. The second way is by buying an annuity, excuse me, is by lending her money, 
uh, which she can, in Mass as long as this is in Massachusetts. In many states, she can't use this option. She could simply lend her money to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, and as long as she lends it to them, and they give her back a promissory note, what is a promissory note? It's a promise to pay the money back. And as long as the promissory note says that the payments are going to be equal monthly payments over a term not longer than her actuarial life expectancy, the exact same as the annuity, then the giving of that money to her kids is not a gift. It's a loan. And the kids are promising to pay it back. Right? Now, does that loan have to be secured? Um, well, we recommend that, that folks who are structuring things this way secure it in some way. Typically, we suggest that instead of just giving all the money to the kids, you want to make sure it's there to get paid back, because otherwise you could be in trouble. So oftentimes, we'll create a trust, name one of the kids as a trustee of the trust for the benefit of the three kids. We'd say the loan goes to the trustee. The, the, the promissory note coming back says that the loan is secured by the rest of the money that's in the trust, and there's an obligation to keep the money in the trust. And so, you, you, and then, the, and then the trust will typically say, following Mary's death, then you know, and if Mass Health has been paid off, the, whatever's left gets distributed to the kids. But the point is, those can be written in a number of different ways. The main point is that none of that is required right now under Massachusetts regulations. You can literally just give the money to the kids, have them promise to pay it back to you at what Mass Health considers to be a reasonable rate, which they've accepted actually as low as a two or a one percent interest rate, right? And then that's all legit. The reason why we typically don't recommend these is I think that, I think that Mass Health is going to tighten up on these, right? Because many states, the states aren't required to allow these, and many states don't now, like the other New England states don't, right? We do. Um, but for people whose life expectancy is so short that they can't buy a commercial annuity, this is really kind of their only option in, ter as in, in terms of these two possibilities. Um, um, because interest rates have been so low for a number of years, the companies who issue these annuities have now b basically taken the position they won't issue an annuity for less than five years. When Mary gets to be 89, her life expectancy will go below five years, and therefore the option of buying an annuity at that point would go away and she need to do the promissory note. So, she can use the annuity, or she can use the promissory note, or she can put her money in a D4C pooled trust. So, let me start by saying, if you want to know what those are, Google pooled trust, P-O-O-L-E-D, pooled trust, or Google any one of those five entities who are the five nonprofits in Massachusetts um, who are authorized to do pooled trusts. Um, the, first of all, so what is a pooled trust? And what does D4C mean? Well, the, the, the federal Medicaid law, if you wanted to read it, Right? is at 42 U.S.C., United States Code, U.S.C., 1396. And it goes 1396, A, B, C, D, E, F, and it just kind of keeps on going. And you get to P, and P is the section, 1396P, deals with trusts, and deals with the rules regarding money that is held in trust for the benefit of a person trying to qualify for mass health. And the general rules say, if there is a trust and the trustee is holding money, for, a, for, a, for an older person, and if the money came from that older person originally, then the trustee has to use his or her maximum discretion to use the money for the beneficiary and pay the nursing home before that person can qualify for mass health. So all the trust money in that case is considered to be a countable asset. But there are three exceptions, and they are at 1396 P1 something, D4A, D4B, and D4C. These are D4C trusts. I won't go into the other two. They are not relevant to this case. So to be a D4C pool trust, you have to be administered by a nonprofit organization that operates for the benefit of elderly or disabled people, which all of them do. You have to create a structure through which you will accept money from elders and pool it, put it together with all the other money that you have from other people, from other elders, and invest it and reinvest it but you keep track of it for accounting purposes so that the interest that you earn, minus your commission, which is typically a point, one point per year, um, is held for the benefit of the elder. Now, what would this money be used for? You know, if Mary has, Mary's now in a nursing home, she's got her house still, right? She's got her $325,000 that she's putting it into the pool trust, 
And as a result of transferring the money to the pool trust, the day after Mary puts the money in the pool trust, she now qualifies for Mass Health because she's now below the $2,000, right? She just put all of her money in the pool trust. Mass Health will have a lien against that money following her death to make sure that it gets paid back whatever it paid on her behalf. But because she's now on Mass Health, her burn rate has gone down to $5,000 a month, right? Because Mass Health is simply going to be paying the nursing home $5,000 a month in addition to Mary's $2,000 to get to the seven, right? And then that's the amount that will be owed back to Mass Health um, after Mary dies. So she's, she's saved this money. But why would, what could you do with this money? Well, you can pretty much do anything, anything you want with the money that will help Mary. That's the kind of the broad statement. But what could you do? Well, let me give you the two, two I think, illustrative examples. How many people here have been visited a nursing home before? Raise your hand. Ah, just about everybody has been to a nursing home. So maybe you have had a different experience from me, but my experience when I've been going to a nursing home has been that the, the most depressing part about me going to a nursing home is the, usually the hallways and the people sitting in wheelchairs in the hallways like this, right? Trying to sleep. Now, of course, you know, in, in, if you're in a nursing home and your alternatives are either to be in bed, right, or to be in a, in a wheelchair, a lot of times you want to be in a wheelchair. And actually the people there want you to be in a wheelchair because you're not going to get bed sores. You're just being in bed all the time. But the reason why that particular person is like this is because of the wheelchair, right? Because they're not sitting in a wheelchair that was designed to be sat in for long periods. They're sitting in a standard wheelchair that was designed to push people from one room to another, right? So they're sitting in one, and it's got kind of a clawed back, you know, and it's got aluminum arms, and it costs like $1,000, and it's the nursing home's wheelchair. Now, for $10,000, you can buy a wheelchair. It's got all kinds of padding. It reclines. They're motorized. You can get a TV set. You can get headphones, watch whatever movies you want, listen to music. You know, you can have a good time. Well, not a great time in this wheelchair, you know but as good a time as you can have. And if you're Mary, and you're stuck in the nursing home, which you don't want to be, you know, we all get that. Mary's ideal day would be a day not in the nursing home. But if you're in the nursing home, the question is, what's your best day in the nursing home? Right? And it's not a day in bed. Right? It's a day in this kind of situation. So that's one example. But that $10,000 wheelchair, Mass Health. On that $72.80 you get to keep, you're going to be saving a long time before you buy that wheelchair, right? But the D4C can buy that wheelchair for Mary. Now I'll give you the other example. A couple weeks ago, well, let's get three weeks ago, I was in a nursing home visit. I go to nursing homes a lot, you know. So I was in a nursing home visiting this very nice lady who actually I had known her when she was younger. She now has dementia. She's in her mid-80s. And she was sitting there. And then in the other bed, because all these are all doubles, nursing home just has like just no singles, everything's a double. Uh, and in the other bed is a very nice, equally pleasant seeming 85 year old Spanish lady. And I assume that she's Spanish because her TV is on loud because she can't hear very well, and it's all in Spanish. So now imagine my client with dementia has a little trouble remembering exactly where she is anyway, and as far as she knows, she's in Mexico. She has no idea, you know, where she might be. Now, that is a problem, and, and I, I use that, and it's kind of a funny, but it, it illustrates the hardest problem about a nursing home, which is lack of privacy, right? Because you're always in a double, and you're always listening to the other person's TV, which inevitably is on, right? So, you can solve that, though. You can get a flat screen TV, you can get headphones, you can get CD players, you can, you, can, you can make it your own world. You can't force the other person to be totally quiet, you know. You might want to get them a CD or a set of headphones also, so you don't have to listen to their TV set, right? But the point is, the D4C can buy all that stuff. It can buy the TV. It can buy as many DVDs as you could ever want, you know, which used to be the case. Now you just buy, you buy Netflix, right? And so you can just watch whatever you want. You can watch, you know, Sound of Music a thousand times, right? So, or, or you can buy better food. So that, the reason for the lobster, um, I did this presentation, it's now quite a few years ago, like about six years ago. And I was, after the presentation, a lady comes up to me, she says, oh, Mr. Bergeron, she says, you know, I should have talked to you sooner. They always say that. Oh, I should have talked to you sooner. 
Um, so my mother's been in a nursing home for a couple of years. We started off, she sold, we sold the house, you know, she had a quarter of a million dollars. Now she's only got 60,000 left. And she said, she, when I had done the presentation, it was on the D4C, and she said, so that wouldn't be useful for my mother, right? I said, well, yeah. I said, $60,000 in the nursing home world isn't a lot of money. It's like five months in the nursing home. But in the real world, 60000 is a lot of money. I said, think what you could buy for your mother you know, with $60,000, right? So she did, and so, you know, we talked to her, and they had, we put the money in the D4C, and the next day the mother was eligible for mass health, so we qualified her. And then the social worker came out from the D4C, because they all have social workers, right? To, to figure out what the care plan was going to be, how we're gonna spend this money on Mary, because it's Mary's money, right? And so, she was, so it was me and, 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 and Mary, when I say Mary, my, so the, the mother. I'm starting to think of all old people now as being Frank and Mary. It's a strange thing. And actually, I've come to realize very few people now even know my name anymore. I just see me and, are you the Frank and Mary guy? Yeah, that's right. I'm the Frank and Mary. So anyway, the lady who was coming and she was talking, she said, so what would your mother, what do you think would make your mother's life better? You know, do you think, and she suggested some of this. Could we get her like a, you know, does she like movies? Could we get her a flat screen TV? We could get her a C, you know, DVD player and all this stuff. And she said, well, actually, my mother's 95 now. She's really blind, you know. This wouldn't do anything. So he said, okay, does she like any, you know, particular kind of music, you know? She could listen to Frank Sinatra every day, all the time, you know? She could get a CD player, once again, a set of headphones, so it's really insulated, good sound, right? Oh, no, she really can't hear very well either, said <laughs> lady. So, so he said, well, does your mother have any favorite foods, right? And she goes, oh, she said, you know, she said, we, we, we were growing up, we, 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 there wasn't been, there wasn't a, we didn't have a lot of money. You know, my dad, we were five kids. But a couple times a year, we would go to the shore, and then we'd go out for dinner, and we'd always have lobster in the rough. My mother loved lobster. And the lady just looked at her and said, your mother can have lobster anytime she wants, you know. And the woman's kind of smiled, you know. So a few years later, right, I'm at the, I think this was in Ashland. I was at the same senior center. And the daughter was there. I hadn't heard from her, right? So I said, how's your mother? Oh, she passed away. I guess it was about three years later. She passed away, she said, the previous year. So she lived another two years in the nursing home. And so I asked her, I said, so I got to ask. I said, so did your mother ever have lobster? She said, she had lobster every week. She said, and, and I mentioned that story because, because I, you know, a lot of times I do these presentations where I talk to people and inevitably, not inevitably, but some folks will still come up and say, isn't, isn't this just kind of a scam on the system, you know? This is kind of like the Ronald Reagan welfare queen type thing. And I said, well, you know, Mary didn't decide to get Alzheimer's and go to a nursing home so that she could beat the system, right? She just happened to be stuck in a system where there's one major disease that isn't covered so by Medicare, and that's Alzheimer's, right? And so she's just stuck there. And so for her and those like her, they have the choice of getting wiped out or doing something like this. But is it so terrible in the system that Mary gets to use some of her own money, right, that she and her husband saved up during their lifetime to buy a lobster? You know. So anyway, you can buy food. You can do trips. You know, if Mary is still kind of physically okay but, um, or, or mentally okay, and, but just quit, can't be like at home all the time. You can always take her out. You can go to the movies. You can do whatever you want. If you go on a trip, uh, the D4C will pay for the trip. They'll pay for you to go with Mary because she can't go by herself, right? So they'll pay the whole thing. Home maintenance. Remember, in this situation, Mary took her $325,000 and put it in the D4C, but she's still got her house now, right? Which now she's qualified for Mass Health, but there's a lien on the house. But now, who pays for the taxes on the house? Because all of her income, of course, has to go to the nursing home. So what about the heating bill, or the insurance, or the taxes? Well, the D4C can pay for all of that, because it's Mary's house, right? So the D4C can do a lot of things for Mary. Now, once Mary has died, there is a lien against this money, right, to get Mass Health paid back. But once again, we've cut down on this, on the, on this burn rate. So why wouldn't you do this instead of doing any of the annuities or any of that stuff because the burn rate ends up being the same. You're losing the money at the rate of 5000 a month. Well, that's why. Because if, if all of the D4Cs will tell you that, that once the money has been in the D4C for some period of time, 
um, it, when, when, when the older person dies, they will keep some of the money. And they'll tell you that up front, and the amounts that they'll keep, and the amount of time that it takes varies from D4C to D4C. But I'll give you that extreme case. There is one D4C that after two years, they will keep 20% of the money, right? So if you, if Mary had put in all of her money, all $325,000 to qualify for mass health, and two years later hadn't used any of it for whatever reason, right? Or died the next day, put it in. No, she has to have lived for two years. If, if in this particular D4C, if you, if you live for less than two years, I think they keep like 5% or something. But if it was two years later, then, then the D4C would keep 20% of the money, and the rest of the money would be subject to the mass health lien. So instead of having $325,000 with which to pay the mass health lien, you end up with only 80% of that, or $260,000. You see, so there's a little bit, I'm gonna answer all questions after, okay? So, so there is that disincentive. So, so what you may wanna end up doing, and this is kind of traditionally what people will do, is they'll balance the two out. And they'll say, well, maybe we'll do an annuity for some of the money, and then we'll keep the, in the D4C enough money to make sure that Mary has whatever we think she's going to need for the rest of her life. Typically, that doesn't need to be all the money. So say Mary decided that she was going to get the, her, use her annuity to get the monthly payments to the nursing home to be almost exactly the same as the nursing home bill at the mass health rate. Remember, 7000 a month? So if Mary took um, and bought, say, a four-year annuity, I'm just picking four years, say she guesses and says, probably in Ma's current state of health, she's not going to live more than four years. So we're going to buy an annuity that's going to pay the nursing home $5,000 a month for four years. Well, if you do the math on that, that's going to cost Mary about $240,000, assuming that the annuity is paying, like, no interest, which, like I said, they probably do pay no interest. So if she did that, and remember she had a total of $325,000, and then she took the rest of the money, the $85,000, and put it into the D4C, right? And then if Mary died, you know, after those, at the end of those four years, if none of the money had been used up, then the, the kind of the cost of having had it in the D4C would only be 20% of that smaller number, 20% of $85,000, uh, or $17,000, as opposed to being 20% of the very big number. So there isn't a, a perfect mix between these two, right? Um, it's always a matter of kind of figuring out your, your, your own situation. Um, one, among other things, you want to think about Mary's life expectancy. If Mary's life expectancy is very short, and so your goal is to simply reduce this burn rate for six months or a year, right? And, 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 and you don't think, because of the state of her health, she's going to really be able to use or take advantage of anything through the D4C, you might want to put, park all the money in the, uh, in the annuity. On the other hand, if you think Mary is going to be living for a while, and she is, you know, she, and you think she could really benefit from some of these things that could really improve life in the nursing home, then you might want to put in more. So, for example, say Mary's situation was that. Suppose she only had 75000 in in assets in addition to her house. Well, in that situation, you might want to think, well, maybe we'll just take the $75,000, put it in the D4C, thereby getting her assets below $2,000. She qualifies right away. They put a lien on the house, but now, once again, the burn rate, the rate at which the, 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 um, the lien on the house is growing is just $5,000 a month versus the $10,000 a month if you're in the nursing home. Um, we already talked about that. But what about the other example? I, I often, I shouldn't say often, I on occasion I get folks, and, they'll, and, they're, they're, and someone's going into the nursing home, and they have actually quite a bit of money. And they'll say, well, why don't I just stay on, why don't I just go on private pay until I've run through the look-back period? Everybody, of course, has heard of the look-back period, right? You know, that you've always, that's what you always hear on the radio and all this stuff. Oh, if you're going to save your money for mass health, you have to give it all away or put it into an irrevocable trust and wait five years, and then it'll all be safe. Now, as, as we've gone through, if you're Frank and Mary, you don't have to do that. Right? And if Frank dies and leaves everything in trust for Mary, you don't have to do that. If you're just Mary and you haven't done any planning, then you do. But the flip side of that is that if Mary goes into the nursing home and has done no planning, one option for her 
is to immediately give away all of her assets to her kids. Right away, $625,000. And have the kids then paying the nursing home bill every month for five years. Because on the first day following the fifth anniversary of when she gave everything away, everything else is safe. Because the look back period is only five years. So if you give everything away and then you're in the nursing home and you pay for five years, then you're okay. So what would that cost in this case? Well, it's not hard to figure. Remember the private pay raise or the, the burn rate on those assets is 12,000 minus 2,000 or $10,000 per month. So in five years, on private pay, you're going to spend, you're going to burn away $600,000 in assets. So for our, our old example where Mary has $625,000 in assets, this is such a great idea, right? Because at the end of five years, they've only got $25,000 left, right? But suppose Mary had those assets. Suppose her house were worth more, she had a bigger IRA, and she had total assets of $1,125,000 or some other big number. So how do you figure out at which point or when, whenever it is worth spending, the, giving away all the assets and, and, and being on private pay for five years versus qualifying for mass health right away? And the answer in this case is pretty straightforward. Once again, you always want to do the math regarding your own case. The answer is, first of all, if you were to, if, if Mary with one million one hundred twenty-five thousand um, were to be on private pay for five years, she's going to spend that same six hundred thousand dollars, right, that we were talking about. Um, but then she's going to have a lot more left because she started off with a lot more, five hundred twenty-five thousand, um, because that burn rate was ten thousand dollars per year for 60 months or 600,000. Now, if Mary had been on mass health during those five months, right, what would she have burned away? She would have burned away 60 months times $5,000, right? Or $300,000. So at the end of those five years, Mary would have burned away half of what she burned away if she was on private pay. So in Mary's case, it looks like as long as she's only going to live for five years, right, this is the sensible alternative. Now, the thing about the giving it away and, 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 then, and then paying for the five years option is that at the end of those five years, the nursing home bill stops, right? At the end of those five years, you've been paying, you've been burning away $10,000 a month for five years, but then everything else is safe and the burning stops. On the other hand, if you're on mass health, if you're on mass health, you've been, you've been only burning away at $5,000 a year, but at the end of the five years, you continue to continue burning, right? So if Mary lives beyond five years, she's still shrinking assets at the rate of $5,000 a month. So the question is, where do these two lines cross, right? And the answer is, if Mary lives for 10 years. If Mary lived for 10 years, then, then, during those 10 years, she would have burned away a total of $600,000. The same amount that Mary burned away in five years on private pay, but then after the end of those five years, she never burned away anymore because everything else was safe. So the, answer to the question, so the answer to the question is, if in Mary's situation, with an income of $2,000 a month, right, the lines cross if Mary lives for more than 10 years in a nursing home. Now, I've been doing this for 37 years. I know of two people who have lived more than 10 years in a nursing home. That is almost unheard of. So in almost all cases, if Mary has this kind of income, the smart move is to qualify for Mass Health right away, not to try to make it past that five years, no matter how much money you have. No matter how much money you have. Let me give you the one example, though, where that's not the case. Suppose Mary goes, Mary, now we're going back to Mary's old asset. She has $625,000. But suppose she has $4,000 a month in income instead of only $2,000 a month. Suppose, in addition, that she had a small long-term care insurance policy that she bought, right? And that that long-term care insurance policy will pay the nursing home $200 a day, $200 a day for the five years. Now, that's not a small policy, and that's a, there's going to be a pretty significant premium to that. But suppose she has that policy. Well, $200 a day times 30 days in a month is $6,000 a month, which means that for Mary now, going into that nursing home at $12,000 a day, 
Her income is now, her income, which was $4,000 a month, plus the long-term care insurance policy of $6,000 a month, is $10,000 a month. Which means, if she transfers all of her assets out and, decide, and tries to get through those five years, through that look-back period, knowing that at the end, all the rest is safe, the cost of getting through those five years is only $2,000 a month. Times 60 is $120,000. So in this kind of situation, if Mary, and, and I've had this very, very rarely, but on occasion, right, where I've got either people with a very, very high um, uh, uh, pension, right, typically a government pension, sometimes the, the, these are large pensions, or they've got long-term care insurance, right? Now, once again, this strategy wouldn't necessarily make any sense if you're still a couple, right? Because if you're a couple, then if one of you goes into the nursing home, you shift everything to the other one, right? And if the first one dies, you make sure the first one has all the assets in their name so things are going to get held in trust for the benefit of the other one. So you don't need to worry about this game at all, right? But if you're single, if you don't have that option, then there may be this situation where it makes sense to, go to make it through the five years. But, the, but that's, a rare, that's a rare situation, right? Uh... Yeah, so, that, so there's the example. Take in Mary's case, if she had the $625,000, but she had that high income, and she had the long-term care insurance policy, and so the burn rate were only $2,000 a month, right? At the end of the five years, she would only have spent or burned away one hundred twenty. dollars She would have saved $505,000, and that's a permanent savings, no matter how long she stays in the nursing home. Uh, a couple of other things I'm going to... Ignore some of it. Just a couple of things. Uh, first, if Mary, if one of you, some of you may have heard of these, if Mary, if one of Mary's children lives with Mary for at least two years before she goes in the nursing home, and if there is medical documentation that Mary would otherwise have been eligible for nursing home care because she needed help with at least two of the activities of daily living, which are uh, dressing, eating, bathing, toilet, toileting, or transferring, getting across the room or if she needed constant supervision because she had dementia and therefore was otherwise eligible for a nursing home. And if it can be documented that the daughter, typically it's the daughter, sons never do this stuff, the daughter <laughs> stayed at home and really did that and kept Mary out of a nursing home for two years, then at the end of those two years, Mary can give the house to the daughter, just no matter what it's worth. Okay? Finally, there's long-term care insurance other than the example I gave you. This is kind of an important little piece of trivia. I, I mentioned this actually at the last presentation I did, but it's worth repeating here on Martha's Vineyard. Um, if you have one of those, there are many people still have these little, like, these little long-term care insurance policies that were sold back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, and, if they, and as long as you own a long-term care insurance policy, if, it was, if the policy was taken out before March 15th, 1999, and if it would pay $50 a day for two years, 730 days. And if you go to the nursing home, directly from home, and say that you don't intend to return home, and if on the day you get to the nursing home, the policy has at least one day left of coverage on it, and you say, well, wait a minute, it's a two-year policy. Well, many of these policies, you could also use the money for home care. So suppose you had one of these little policies and you had stayed at home, and you'd use the home care to supplement your other care while you were at home but you kept one day worth of the policy. You used 729 days of home care, but you kept one day. You go to the nursing home, you apply for mass health, you can qual you'll qualify, your house is not a countable asset, there's no lien on the house, and there's no claim against the house after you die, no matter what the house is worth. No matter what the house is, give me a million dollar house, doesn't make any difference. Now that's very attractive, but you say to yourself, that was a long time ago. What about if the policy is after that? The answer is the only thing that changes is the policy has to pay $125 a day for at least two years, for 730 days. As long as you have that policy, the day you get to the nursing home, and there's at least one day left on the policy, everything is safe. Everything is safe. So if you still have the opportunity to buy that policy, especially if you're single, if you're widowed, if you're divorced, this, and, and you're under 70, typically you've got to be under 70 to get one of these policies, that's a great deal. Right, and in the in the uh, in the Frank in the Mary case that I was just using, I actually ran into a similar kind of case recently, where the mother 
is at home, mother is widowed, and has one of these policies. Um, and they had, you know, the husband, and, you know, there was a husband and wife, she bought them, well, actually, they each, the husband and wife each had a policy. Husband died, and so his policy went away. But they hadn't done any of this other advanced planning so that the wife inherited all the assets. Now the wife has got all these assets. And so say it's like Mary, right? She's got a house worth about $300,000, and she's got cash or cash equivalents worth about three twenty-five. dollars And the daughter, she's going to move in the, with the daughter. They've been talking about it. She's going to move in, right? They might you know, build a little separate room. And so the daughter's got a big house, so they can do this. So I said to, the, I said to them, I said, well, look, why don't you, why, why, Mom, why don't you just sell your house for three twenty-five? dollars Buy the daughter's house. Buy the daughter's house is worth quite a bit more, right? So buy the house. For, if you buy the house for $625,000, right, and you're going to be living there until you need nursing home care, and then you go to the nursing home and the house is safe, right? Because you got that, she's got that long-term care insurance policy, right? She could buy the daughter's house that was, south that was worth a million dollars, right? Bury all the money in the house, because it does make no difference how, how much the house is worth, or when you bought it, as long as you reside at the house before you go, to, like the day before you go to the nursing. See how that would work? So it's just, it's like a little, just a little piece of trivia. Finally, um, I'm not going to go through that. Um, if you are, you know, just fascinated by this, but you said, man, that was a lot of math, you know? And maybe you want to see it again, or you know anybody that wants to see it. First of all, thanks once again to Martha's Vineyard Cable. I can't tell you how many people have said how much they appreciate being able to see this, because many of the people who need to see this can't get here, because they're at home, right? Because they're taking care of somebody. So um, this will be replayed on Martha's Vineyard Cable, and also Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel. Um, and this show and all of the presentations that I do will be, typically this will be up within a, a couple of weeks. Uh, that's it. Any, and remember the goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. To sleep well at night. So if this is, wasn't helpful, well, you know, it was a night out and you got, you know, a sandwich from the black dog. And, and maybe it was helpful. Any questions from anybody? I know I went through a lot of stuff. Yes, sir? Should that be your primary residence? Uh, will that be your primary residence? No, does it have to be your primary no, residence? Yes, it has, to be, it has to be your primary residence. It can't be a vacation. So, you, so if you've got the, the, the little house in Middleborough and the, big, and the nice house in Martha's Vineyard, you need to move to it before you go to the nursing home. It has to be your primary residence the day before you go to the nursing home. Okay, how about when you go to the nursing home and they're taking on the... Ten thousand dollars a month yep. against what? Will they take it against something that's not your primary residence? The question is, will they take the ten thousand dollars? If you go to the nursing home, well, I, I'm, I'm not quite understanding the question. If you're going the, to the nursing home and you're What's on private pay, problem? if you go to, if you're in a nursing home and you own commercial property, the commercial property, if it is generating an income stream, not losing money, has to be, um, will not be a countable asset, but they'll lien it. Okay. So they, they, they won't force you to sell the commercial property and turn it into cash. They will require that the income go to the nursing home, right? They'll qualify you for mass health, but they'll lien the, the commercial property. And the commercial property ha will have to be in your name. If it's in trust, they'll say that it is countable. It has to be turned back into your name in order to be exempt. So it can, so it can be, it's non-countable, but it's lienable. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. I know that this was kind of a long one, but the information is really important. The takeaway is always do the math. Always do the math. Never assume that you have to be on private pay when you're in the nursing home because you can always qualify for mass health. Thank you very much. If I don't talk to you, have a wonderful holiday season. We will see you next year. Thank you.